Hi, everyone. Today, our guest is Janice Berliner. She is the director of the Master's Training Program for Genetics Counseling at Bay Path University. She has been a clinical genetic counselor for more than 29 years, having earned her MS in Human Genetics Genetic Counseling from the University of Michigan. She joins us with Dr. David Vigorist, who's been on my show many, many times, and I get to pick both of their brains about what exactly is genetic counseling. Thanks for joining us. I'm not the house of cards that falls down easily. I'm strong enough to handle what you throw at me. Welcome to Mental Health News Radio. I'm your host, Kristen Sunanta Walker. Just what are we going to discuss? The intimacy that is mental health. Let's continue to make it as comfortable as discussing brain health or heart health. This show has been on the air for several years and we have amazing co-hosts. And then we created a network of podcasters on mentalhealthnewsradionetwork.com, a place where every possible facet of mental well-being can be talked about openly. My show, after several hundred interviews, the format is this. Intimate, deep, funny, touching, sometimes uncomfortable, but always vulnerable conversations with interesting people. The goal is to have you, our listening family, many of you who have become my good friends, feel as though you are listening in on private conversations. Thank you for tuning in and becoming part of this amazing journey with me and now with our network of podcasters. Just knowing this podcast might be helping any of you realize you are not alone on this journey called being a human being makes doing this podcast worth every second. Hey everyone, thank you for joining us. We've got a special show that we're doing with Bay Path University and we are speaking with Janice Berliner. You just heard who she is, but we also have Dr. Dave Vigorist who's been on the show many, many times. First, I want to welcome you, Dave. Thanks for helping me do this conversation. <laughs> thank you so much for, for inviting me. Pleasure to be here again. Absolutely. And Janice, thank you so much for coming on and talking about a subject that fascinates me, but I'm definitely not, you know, the best person to ask the perfect questions. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. So the whole idea around or the topic of being a genetic counselor, obviously, I don't know that much about it, but it fascinates me. So how long have you um, been doing this? A little over 30 years. Mm. So, yeah, you're a great person to then talk about the field. <laughs> Dr. Biggers, do you and I had talked about it. I didn't know anything about this particular field. I thought it was something new and you had shared with me, no, this has been around, you know, for a long time. So were you surprised that I had no idea? Uh, well, um, unless you've been in a clinical setting, you probably wouldn't have come across a, a genetic right. counselor. You know, so, you know, for the most part, when I come across you know, people who are in this field, it's in the hospital, they're giving advice to patients, to physicians, they're, you know, so they're more of a clinical based, and you can, by, by all means, correct me if I'm, if I'm off base here, but they're more of a, you find them more in clinical settings, and you may not have had that experience, you know, encountering them in any of these clinical settings. Right, exactly. And I haven't. Um, so Janice, what made this be the field that you wanted to get into? Well, like a lot of people in my field, maybe most of them, I always loved science. I had an aptitude for it, but I wasn't the kind of person who felt I would be comfortable working in a laboratory, which tends to be maybe a little less social or patient oriented. You have the patient on the other end, perhaps of the laboratory testing that you're doing, but you don't have that connection. And so I wanted to be able to marry the science that I loved with the part of it that allows you to interact with people who are in need of medical advice, genetics information, and, and testing options. What type of genetic counseling did you practice? And, and are there subspecialties? There are uh, more and more, it seems, every year. So when I began in practice, there were really two ways you could go. You could work with the prenatal patients, meaning those who are pregnant or hoping to be and are concerned about their risks for having a child with some sort of disorder, depending upon their family history, medical history, exposures that they've had, et cetera. 
maternal age. Um, or you could be in pediatrics, which meant evaluating or helping to evaluate babies in the newborn ICU or um, young children who had developmental disabilities or congenital anomalies. And if you were really lucky, you could have a job where you were able to do both of those things. That was 30 years ago. <laughs> it's changed a lot now. So we now have genetic counselors in oncology, cardiology, neurology, ophthalmology, laboratories, public health, newborn screening, <laughs> right? Kind of everywhere. And I and think cancer risk assessment for 20 plus years. I think what fascinated me is I could understand this in terms of everything you just stated and, you know, having a genetic counselor come in to talk to you about an ophthalmology or cardiology, I didn't understand, or it opened up a whole new world of, oh my gosh, this can help so many people if they paid attention to this in the world of mental health. Mm -hmm. So that's where I went, okay, I need to know more about this. I have a family history of this. What you know, what could have helped me years ago when I was first diagnosed with depression and dysthymia was, you know, why wasn't there a genetic counselor brought in? I had the right kind of insurance. I had this and that, but it's only in the last few years that it's been sort of talked about in more of a mainstream way in the field of mental health. And that's where I thought, okay, I've got to make a point of talking about this as a resource for people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you bring up a very good point, and I have found throughout the course of my career in any subspecialty of genetic counseling that there are an awful lot of people who could benefit from the services who are simply not ever told about them for a variety of reasons. So that is not limited to psychiatric disorders, although it's, I imagine, prevalent there. And that may partially be because there really aren't any genetic tests that we can provide at this point. So it's not like we can evaluate a family member, do some genetic testing, say, okay, this person has X alteration in whatever gene, and therefore we can test other people in the family to see if they have it as well. So there's counseling that can be helpful, and we can talk about that, but it's not um, as clear cut as in some other specialties at this point. Dr. Vickers, what, you know, you being in, in the testing field, as our listeners know, what, you know, what do you say about, about that piece of information? Well, it's one of those things that it, I think it's been a slow evolution, right? Um, some of those pediatric disorders and disorders that you might consider prior to having, having children have been known for a long time. Um, when you get into cancer, maybe the last 30 years or so, we've, we've discovered a lot more in the, in the field of cancer. We've discovered a little bit more in the field of cardiology. So it's, it's kind of been a slow evolution to determine, well, what genetic features might be important in a given disorder or disease. And I, I don't know if you would agree or disagree with that, but you know, cancer has probably been the one place that genetics has had more of a showing uh, because we've discovered you know, certain genes are contributors to the development of cancers, BRCA, you know, mm -hmm. KRAS. I mean, there's a number of them that have been discovered that have fairly good connections and linkages. Mm -hmm. I don't know that that's really been done at, to the same degree for other kinds of disorders. So coming up with a test, test for schizophrenia, a test for depression that is, you know, in, in every single patient who has that is, is probably still not quite there. Right. right. And the other issue I find is there are discrete genes or categories of genes that may be responsible for, let's say, cancer predisposition or for uh, cardiomyopathy or other things we know how to test for now. With psychiatric disorders, similar to the way autoimmune disorders work, what the genetic susceptibility seems to be is for a predisposition for the whole category, not for necessarily a specific disorder. So if there's a family that has an increased risk for psychiatric disorders, you may see one person in the family with schizophrenia, another with bipolar disorder, maybe a third with an eating disorder or um, substance abuse, though they're not necessarily all the same within a family. Yeah. And you know, it's interesting. There's a company that really um, was talking to us for a while and they were a, a company that really focused on the addiction side. 
And I don't know what either of you would have to say about this, but I thought it was fascinating. I, since I don't know the right questions to ask, and I love doing these shows because now just listening to what the two of you said, I could have asked a better question, but uh, what I have found is, or what I found with this organization was they were saying they've got the genetic test. They've, they can test for different types of substance use disorder, but here's what happened. People would go to the site. They would spend whatever they were going to spend to take these tests to tell them, you know, what's going on with them. And then it was, but if you go to the, uh, this other page on our site where you can buy these vitamins <laughs> and I, and I thought, yeah. That is the wrong way, you know, that immediately, that is not the direction that I would want to, you know, take my listeners for sure, because they're here to find answers. Mm -hmm. They're not here to go be sold, you know, an MLM vitamin thing. And that's what made me realize we have to have bigger conversations about this. So people actually understand what this is and not get out of a lack of knowledge not get caught up in something that isn't possibly, you know, is not really going to help them or, or um, is just, is making claims that aren't true. I'm really glad. Yeah, you I'm right. yeah, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Uh, there are many direct to consumer websites these days that offer all sorts of testing, some genetic, um, some that have some kind of genetic component, but they're geared toward nutrition or sports aptitude or a variety of other things. And the way a lot of these tests are done is through what are called single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs. And as human beings, we have thousands of these SNPs. And to make a long story short, in order to come up with an answer for many of these questions, you have to pick which SNPs you're evaluating. And one lab may use a different set than another lab. And so the information you're getting from each lab may differ wildly. And so how do you utilize that information afterward, if at all, is very difficult. And there isn't a whole lot of data to back up a lot of the claims that these companies make. Right, Dr. Right. Vickers. Yeah, and yeah. yeah I, I read your. I read an article that you that you wrote um, about two months or so ago on this very subject, and I agree with everything you said. That a lot of the DTC companies out there may be testing, you know, a SNP that doesn't really have a lot of evidence behind it, mm -hmm. and you go to another company and they're picking a slightly different SNP. The variability in in our genome uh, means that. You know, one of those SNPs may not have any effect whatsoever on the protein that's produced, right? Mm -hmm. So you just saying you have this SNP doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to process a certain way or behave a certain way or run faster or jump hard, higher. Um, so, you know, you made a comment uh, in this article, and I hope other people get to, you know, go to go to your site and read this this article that the value that you get from some of these DTC tests, right? And I don't necessarily think that those companies are providing the best service to the patient as they are providing the best mechanism for collecting data. Mm -hmm. And you know, maybe that data becomes useful some sometime in the future when we get a large enough sampling to see whether these SNPs are really valuable in terms of making any kind of clinical decision or whether they're just variations in a genome that has millions of variations. Right. Right. I, I appreciate your having read my article and I agree with all of that. It's very frustrating because I think we can probably agree that one day these kinds of tests may be very valuable. I think there's a lot of potential there. It's just that there's so much that we still don't know that to advertise it to the general public mm -hmm. who as a general rule, doesn't have a whole lot of genetics background. Exactly. It, right? It's just, to me, somewhat irresponsible. And Absolutely. there are genetic counselors who work for some of these companies, and I'm sure that they are trying very hard to create an environment where consumers who are purchasing their tests can obtain genetic counseling, or at least some guidance in how to utilize the results that they've been given, but so many people 
probably don't make use of those services. And so there's a lot of misinformation out there. I found that even when I did cancer genetic testing and counseling for a very long time, that there were a lot of people who completely misunderstood what their test results were. Of Either course. because they weren't properly explained or because they forgot or because of anxiety about their conditions or a lot of different reasons, I'm sure. But it's, it's scary. I, I can tell you from, you know, the lay person that ditched science to go surfing because uh, it just was way over my head. Uh, A's in English and, you know, and uh, essay writing and all that, but forget science and math. Um, you know, but I also was someone, I want to know what is going on in, in the world when it comes to mental health. And this is a huge piece of it that could be so helpful. So to me, I got excited about it and then went down the road of taking some tests, not knowing what the heck I'm looking mm-hmm. at. And like you said, Janice, getting anxiety, reading it, going, I don't even know what this means. Should I start feeling stupid? Nope, don't do that. You know, just <laughs> all, all those things that come up and then, oh, it's all prepackaged on this nice website. So tell me if I'm wrong about this. I'll put this out to both of you. We do we, there is enough data out there and, and we can with some certainty or maybe complete certainty do genetic tests to tell us what medications, psychiatric medications may or may not work or would be better than others. Like that is a for sure availability, correct? For some, for some things, yes. Um, okay. So when you go and you look at some of the metabolic pathways, you can probably get some insights. Okay. Um, I don't know that, if, that we have a good enough panel. Have we selected the right genes? Have we selected the right pathways to test? to see if someone's guaranteed to respond. And it was a, that's kind of tied to a comment I was going to make about, you know, people do these tests, but what you don't have is the, the other context around that person's life, right? So the test gives you one piece of information, um, just like if you were, t- you know, testing someone for cancer susceptibility. They've got this gene. Maybe it provides, a, you know, an enhanced susceptibility But do they smoke? Are there other factors that may be involved in that that you don't necessarily know? And that's that's probably what we're going to get back to with some of this other kinds of testing for psychiatric meds. You know, having the test is one piece of useful information, perhaps. But what else do we know about the patient that might also help to add some additional guidance? Mm -hmm. And that's where a genetic counselor can offer some guidance on, well, this is what this means from a genetic standpoint, and that in combination with the clinician can factor in, you know, the other lifestyle and and personal information, history and physical information that might offer some more guidance. So we're getting closer maybe for some of those things like in pharmacogenetics and genomics. Mm -hmm. We know some genes that are involved in metabolism. We know some genes that are involved in receptors. We know some genes that are involved in transporters. Putting all that together in the context of the whole patient, I think is still something we're working towards getting better at. Gotcha. I completely agree, but I would like to emphasize that when we're talking about genetic testing in this concept context, we're talking about testing somebody's genes that help to metabolize or not certain medications. This is not the same thing as the genetics of what's causing or contributing to the psychiatric illness in the first place. Mm, The genetics of that is really, to my knowledge, in its infancy. And so they're two very, very different things, very important, both of them, but different. And it's one of the things where, and why I, I think you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like the the now it's popular to talk about mental health. Thank God we've all worked for a long time to make that happen. This network was created to make that happen. It's being, you know, the stigma around it is being taken away chip by chip by chip. And it's at a good place in terms of the United States, better than it's ever been in terms of acceptability. And with that comes funding because places like Walmart, as an example, in quarter four of 2018, made a big to-do about how they were going to have mental health counseling centers in some of their Walmarts, not owned by Walmart, but, you know, they don't make a big press release when they get a new nail salon in a Walmart, but they made a big deal about 
talking about having mental health centers and what that told me as a consumer and being in the businesses, okay, now it's um, a moneyed initiative that business, big business is going towards aligning with mental health initiatives. What that says to me the, for the future of this, I hope is, okay, what we need for you guys to do what you do is it needs more funding. Cancer gets a lot of funding towards mm -hmm. genetic testing. Mental health hasn't, but maybe it will. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I, I liken it to an experience I had when my daughter was 10 and was diagnosed with celiac disease. And we had to go far and wide to find any gluten-free foods for her. Right. And then suddenly, it, or gradually, I guess it wasn't sudden, um, it, we found this critical mass of people in the country who either have celiac or are gluten sensitive. And now because right. the money was there, there's a proliferation of gluten-free items everywhere. And I will tell you the first time I saw a Duncan Hines gluten-free cake on the shelf mix <laughs> next to the regular one, I stood in the supermarket and cried. Yeah. I thought the water will be okay. Right. And it's very much to me, the same kind of thing is once there is enough of a societal recognition that this is an issue, it's a common one, it's something we almost all deal with in some form or another, then, like you said, the money comes. Right, right. And, you know, we can go on a whole other show and we have a wonderful podcast that talks about those kinds of things and that has its own animal and issues and engine behind it. But still, money is, a you know, the biggest factor towards being able to go and study these things and do right. the tests and all of that. So um, I wanted to ask you both about, you know, you both, I guess, went at this differently. Janice, you were in the clinical setting and then you went to academia. Dr. Vigorous, you started in the academic setting and went into the, the, um, the clinical and also um, testing. Well, that is clinical, but um, why, let's start with you, Janice, why did you make that, that switch into the academic world? Mm. It was actually something I had wanted to do from the very beginning of my career, not because I didn't love my clinical work and my patients, but because I had always had a passion for education. So given that I loved my profession from day one, I wanted to be able to contribute to the molding of the next generation of genetic counselors. Mm, fantastic. Fact, actually doing it is enormously gratifying. Yeah. And in, in my not knowing enough, I had sent you a first list of questions and I had it so narrowed down to, well, you're teaching a class and you very <laughs> kindly emailed me back and said, no, I'm actually in charge of the entire program. <laughs> and I went, okay, got it. So, <laughs> so how, I know this is through Bay Path University, which we love Bay Path University, but how many courses are there that you are in charge of? I'd have to check. I think it's four or five. Okay. Um, but as the program director, of course, I oversee the curriculum development, admissions, advisory board, all of that um, right. budget um, to keep the program going for our students. <laughs> and Dr. Vigorous, with you, I mean, you're still an alumnus of Vanderbilt on, on the faculty, correct? Yes, I know, sir. Yeah. So I, I've had the last 25 years working in academics and clinical medicine. So I've, I think from the time that I was probably in my early 20s, I've worked in a hospital of, or a hospital or clinic. Mm -hmm. And that's been cancer, that's been cardiology, that's been, you know, endocrinology, it's been throughout the, the uh, spectrum of, of medical specialties. And my interest in moving from the academic side to the, you know, the, if you want to call it commercial side, was, was really an interest in trying to make sure that things got applied that were developed in the lab or on the bench, which was one of the reasons why I went and did a fellowship at St. Jude, and that was so that you could see what's being done research-wise in, in the laboratory and have a direct relationship to how it's deployed in the clinic. So a lot of what I was doing, I really wanted to see it applied to patients so that they can get 
some improvement in whatever condition they're being treated for. So moving out of the university was one way of doing that, was trying to find a way of connecting the, the bench work that's being done, the publishing and the research and such, and putting it into an application that patients can actually benefit. So the two of you together are, are attacking this from two different sides that are both needed. So what, you know, Janice, I see you taking that and going to, well, now I'm going to teach people how to do what Dr. Vigorous is talking about by giving them the education that they need in order to exactly. make that kind of a difference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Nice. Yeah. And, and I think we're still, I think we're still very much in need of more people going down this line of, of training. Mm -hmm. um, in, in my particular case, moving out into the prevention medicine side of things where we were trying to offer people some guidance and everything we do is physician directed. So we don't do anything direct to consumer. Everything we do is for a physician, a cardiologist, an endocrinologist. And in going out and looking for someone who could offer the genetic counseling piece of it, we always came up short. We quite often ran into, well, there's no one who's trained to do that. In, in particular in Tennessee here, I think there are only two genetic counselors who specialize in cardiovascular medicine. Mm -hmm. Everybody else is in oncology. And I would be hard pressed to find someone who specializes in some of these other subdisciplines, mm -hmm. um, like, you know, the neurology and the ocular and all these other things that I think are very much in need. And having someone who's advocating for more people to come into the profession, I think is, is really exciting. And I've not had, very many interactions with genetic counselors outside of oncology. I'd like to see it across the board. And the closest school that I'm aware of is up at, up in Cincinnati. So we need I more people. I will tell you though, Vanderbilt is developing a program. You will have a Good. genetic counseling Good. training program at Vanderbilt very soon. Fantastic, I'm mm -hmm. happy to hear that. I think we need more, more we people. We absolutely do, yes. But I think, we need, I think we need people to offer guidance before testing, right? So like we've been having these conversations about, well, is there genetic testing that can be done for, for mental health? Is there genetic testing that can be done for cardiovascular and these other things? I think when people start to think about, well, should I get tested? I mean, there's all of this genetic testing that's out there in the market. Should I get tested? Should I do it with a direct-to-consumer or should I do it with a clinical grade company? And what does it mean I, I totally if I go do this testing, right? right. I agree. So, and a big part of the problem with the direct-to-consumer testing is that sometimes information can be obtained that the person purchasing the test didn't bargain for. And we don't know what the hell we're right. looking at. Well, that too. Right. <laughs> there's, there's definitely and, and that too. And so from, from the standpoint of training genetic counselors, when I went to my training program at the University of Michigan in the late 80s, there were 10 genetic counseling training programs in North America. There are now 50, 46 in the US and four in Canada. So that's a huge progression, but the programs are still relatively small, competitive to get into as you'd hope, and we need more. So that, that's definitely a push. So Vanderbilt is in development and there are a number of others. And I would imagine that each year there will be more. The, the only difficult aspect of that is each student needs to do several clinical rotations to learn, not just academically, but clinically, how to provide these services. And the more programs we have, the more difficult it can be sometimes to find clinical placements for students. So it is a limiting factor to some extent. Would you say that most of the most of the programs are at academic medical centers or are they distributed um, all over? Yeah, probably more often than not they are, but there are certainly private universities like Bay Path, Sarah Lawrence College that was the, is the first and oldest, sorry, oldest and largest genetic counseling training program. And there are others that are not associated with medical centers directly but we affiliate with them in order to provide the clinical instruction for our students. Tell me, Janice, you first, but what kind of criteria would someone 
you know, that they're in, they're starting out studying, maybe they're thinking they're already going to Bay Path or another institution and they're, you know, they're wanting to do something different. To me, this is, even though it's been around, it's so siloed that um, I'm just now starting to hear more, oh, the genetics counseling, that is the hot new <laughs> thing to get involved in. Well, great, good. We want that kind of attention there. But what would someone's interest, you know, need to be or, you know, that would, that would, maybe they don't even know that this is something they should do. What kind of background would they, you know, need to have that kind of thing? Well, it varies a lot. I would say with our applicants, the majority have a biology and or psychology background. Okay. But that's not imperative. So we do have a number of prerequisite courses and the other programs do as well in biology, chemistry, biochemistry, statistics, psychology. But as long as you have those prerequisites, it doesn't matter to me if your major was political science. If you decide that this is something that you'd like to do, I encourage anyone to look into it more. The National Society of Genetic Counselors has a website. It's nsgc.org. There's also the website of the um, American Board of Genetic Counseling at abgc.net, both of which can help a lot in terms of what does it mean to be a genetic counselor? Where can you practice? In what kind of specialties can you practice? What admissions requirements are there in general? What about board certification and licensure? All of that information can be found on those two websites. And of course, if you go to the Bay Path University Genetic Counseling site, there's a lot of information there as well. Absolutely. Including my contact information. If people have questions, I'm happy to entertain them. And what is your website? Because you've got some terrific blog articles there. Oh, thank you. Yeah, my personal website is very simple. It's JaniceBerliner.com. And I, I welcome all. I, the impetus for creating the website was a novel that I wrote that has a genetics theme to it. But I've also put a number of blog posts on there, and I'm continually thinking of more things to write about. So I'm open to suggestions. Mm. What people want to hear about is what I'll write about. Wonderful. And Dr. Vigorist, I mean, you can be found just by Googling your name. And But do you have a new website for us? Not just yet. We're still building that. We'll <laughs> okay. be launched that here shortly, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> well, if anybody needs to, you can Google Dr. Dave, V-I-G-E-R-U-S-T, or you can go to digitaltechinitiative.com and that'll um, take you to information about Dr. Vigorous as well. But I want to say thank you both for coming on and um, explaining this to us lay people out there so we know what the heck this is and where it's going. That's the biggest thing too. What What's the reality of this and where it's headed? The two of you explained that very, very well and hopefully demystified it for a lot of people that are just, you know, unfortunately being taken in by a lot of this direct to consumer stuff that isn't necessarily the way we want things to go. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's an important, uh, it's an important field and I hope mo more people will seek out genetic counselors when they think about testing. Absolutely. Janice, thank you so much for coming on. Well, thank you for having me. It was such a pleasure to be with you. Absolutely. And listeners, thank you for tuning in to another episode of mental health news radio. But never without good intentions I heat up and act on my emotions Thanks so much for listening to Mental Health News Radio. Our podcast can be found on iTunes, Stitcher, and hundreds of other podcast apps. Or you can visit our website at mentalhealthnewsradio.com. If you have a question or would like to be a guest, become a podcaster on our network, or join the amazing organizations that help keep us on the air, please email us at info at mhnrnetwork.com. Get ready for that special goodbye from our resident therapy dog, Miles, and a special thanks to Emily Sohn for letting us use her incredible song, Cordial, for our podcast music. Listen to the full song on SoundCloud at emily.sonne. Don't be surprised when I don't hate on you. After all we promised.